Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. I also want to encourage you to check out our Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. If you've not already, I do want to encourage you to check out my wife's business, Ashira Clips. That's at lilarose.biz, L-I-L-L-A rose dot biz slash Ashira. There she sells a wide variety of different hair clips, headbands, and hairpins to fit the wide variety of different tastes. Plus, uh, they come in different sizes to fit different hair types. They make a great gift and are quite fetching look. You can check them out at lilarose.biz, L-I-L-L-A rose dot biz slash Ashira, A-S-H-I-R-A. Well, now it is time for this week's episode of Philo Vance. And last week's episode was the last one that we can confirm was part of the KGO run. So this is the main syndicated run, and the first time we can verify this episode having aired was quite a bit after the last one, because the main syndicated run started in July of 1948, while the KGO run started in March. So, even though there were no missing episodes between, the original air date that we have for this episode is March the 1st, 1949, and the title is The Listless Murder Case. Is this today's collection, Donald? Uh, yes, Mr. Miller. I opened the mail myself this morning. And all the checks are here, hmm? Uh-huh. Fine. Tell me, what's the total? $12,450. All the checks are made out to consolidated charities, Mr. Miller. Of course. That's so that no irresponsible party can cash them, Donald. You see, people who contribute to our campaign want to make sure that the money goes to charity. I understand, sir. Would you be interested in the total we've collected so far? Yes. What is the amount? Uh, here it is. $130,000. Good. And our campaign is less than two weeks old. Everything is going according to plan. Oh, Donald, has Morton Gary phoned today? Uh, not yet. I imagine he will, though. He's very interested in knowing how the drive is coming. He's taking that business of being chairman of Consolidated Charities too seriously. Oh, you think he may be a problem? Perhaps. It's, Gary is a very prominent man. We need him. His name on our letterhead assures the legitimacy of our organization. Mr. Miller. Yes? What happens if Mr. Gary finds out what's really happening to the money? You mean suppose he finds out that only a small percentage goes to charity and I pocket the rest? Yes, sir. I don't think he'll find out, Donald. I'll answer that. Hello? Mike, Elise Avery. Hello, Elise. I thought this was old man Gary calling in. What's going on? I just hit a big one, Mike. Some sucker just gave me a check for five grand. Good for you, girl. Bring it in with you. Sure. Just thought you'd like to hear the good news, that's all. See you later. Bye. Bye. Now, where were we, Donald? We were just talking about Morton Gary. And what would happen if he found out what we're doing and the money we're collecting? First of all, he isn't going to find out. No? No. And second, even if he does, it doesn't matter too much. He'll squawk, Mr. Miller. He'll take this up with the police, maybe with the FBI. After all, we're using the mails. Yes, that's true, Donald. We are using the mails. And the mails are bringing us in a fortune. But Gary won't talk. Believe me. And even if he does start to talk, he'll never finish what he's saying. You can believe that, too. Mike? Oh, uh, Mike, where are you? 
In my private office, Elise. Come on in. Right. Well, here I am, boss. Armed to the teeth with a check for 5000 The one you phoned about? Mm-hmm. Lay it right here, lady. I want to look at it. Here you are, chum. Pay to the order of Consolidated Charities. Five O O O. Endorse it, cash it, and it's all yours. <laughs> People sure are suckers, aren't they, Annie? <laughs> Five thousand dollars. You'd think they'd investigate a charity before they start giving their money away. Sure, but there are lots of legitimate charities, thank goodness. That makes our job that much easier. Oh, uh, Mike, let me take a look at that list. What list? The list of guys who've kicked in and the amounts. I need some dough. Thought maybe you'd give me a check for my commissions. Well, uh, I'll have to get it for you, Elise. Okay. But uh, while we're waiting, suppose you give me my cut of this five grand I just brought in. Uh -uh. Gotta wait till the check clears the bank, baby. You know, you've been dealing with suckers all day. Kindly remember that I'm not one of them. Me either, Mike. That's why I want my commission on the dough I've already brought in. You'll get it. Donald is figuring out what I owe you. He'll have the figures in an hour. Then, if you're a good girl, I'll give you a check. Kid, if I was a good girl, I wouldn't be in this racket. But uh, bad or good, I'll get that check. You're pretty sure you'll get it, hmm? If I don't get it, Mike, you'll get it. Right in the neck. <laughs> I beg your pardon, miss. Yes? I'd like to see the district attorney, please. My name is Morton Gary. Oh, yes, Mr. Gary. You telephoned for an appointment, didn't you? Uh, yes, I did, yes. Uh, well, just a moment, sir. I'll find out if Mr. Markham can see you now. Thank you. Yes, Miss Williams. Uh, Mr. Morton Gary to see you, Mr. Markham, uh, by appointment. I ask him to come in, please. Would you go right in, Mr. Gary? Right through that door there. Uh, this door here? Uh, yes, yes, that's the one, Mr. Gary. Oh, thank you, miss. Thank you. Mr. Markham. Uh, come in, please, Mr. Gary. How do you do, Mr. Markham? Mr. Gary, please sit down, sir. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, Mr. Markham, I've come to ask you to investigate a very unscrupulous man, Mr. Michael Miller. Miller? Don't believe I know the name. I didn't either until a few weeks ago. He's not from this city, Mr. Markham. He claimed to be very philanthropic and was forming an organization to be known as Consolidated Charities. Yes, Mr. Gary. He induced me to lend my name to the organization, which I did. Many of my friends have contributed to it. And now I have reason to believe the entire thing is a fraud. I see. He's collecting money but not turning it over to charity, is that it? Oh, I believe he is turning over a small percentage of the money to legitimate societies, Mr. Markham. But I've asked to see statements of monies collected and dispersed, and Mr. Miller has refused to allow me to see any records. Mm, I begin to understand your suspicions, Mr. Gary. Michael Miller, you said the man's name was? Uh, that's correct. His officers are in the Lions building. Well, I'll investigate this at once, Mr. Gary, and thank you for calling it to my attention. If your suspicions are correct, we'll put a stop to this racket, but fast. <laughs> Three, one. Philo Vance speaking. Uh, Vance, this is Markham. Well, my favorite district attorney calling me at home. Well, thank you. Sounds important, Markham. It is. I called your office and they said you'd left for the day, Vance. I'm in the office of the Consolidated Charities in the Lions Building. How soon can you get here? At once, if it's important. It's very important. We had a complaint late this afternoon about a Mr. Michael Miller, who was the head of this supposed charity organization. Actually, it was a racket. Go ahead, Markham. Who made the complaint? Morton Gary. Oh. You know him, Vance? Yes, I do. Very honest, very wealthy, and very gullible. Well, when I got to this Miller's office a little while ago, Vance, I found Miller dead. He'd been shot twice, once in the heart and once in the calf of his leg. Really, Markham? Strange. And there are no records of any kind here, Vance. Apparently, the murderer took them with him. All that was here when we broke in was the body. The lists are missing, eh, Markham? Yes. Hmm. Apparently, we have a listless murder case. Well, just to generate a little action in it, suppose I describe Miller's killer for you. Describe him, Vance? You haven't even seen the body. You don't know any more about this case than I've just told you. you how can you possibly describe Miller's murderer? I'll explain that to you later, Markham. Right now, all I'll tell you is to look for a murderer with a bruise on his cheek or a black eye. I'm on my way down to meet you now. <laughs> Vance, 
chance, I have Sergeant Heath out searching for someone who has a connection with this case and who also has a black eye or bruised cheek. Now, tell me why. One of the nicest things about you, Markham, is that you do things that I suggest without demanding an explanation. Hmm. Let us retain that fine point in our association until the proper time, shall we? I know your reasoning, Vance. You believe that if you were to explain why you think the murderer is bruised, I'd be prejudiced immediately against any suspect we turned up who did have such a mark. Exactly. Yes. And up until now, I'm quoting only theory, Markham, not fact or proof. Good enough, Vance, good enough. Uh, by the way, if you can table your theory temporarily, we have a suspect for you. Really? Who? A girl named Elise Avery. She's in the next room now. It seems that she came into the Consolidated Charities office while I was waiting for you. She admits she worked here, but denies any knowledge of the shooting of Mr. Miller. Oh, nobody makes our job simple anymore, Markham, do they? Well, that should make you very happy, Vance. You and your theory about the bruise on the killer's face. Do you want to go in and see Miss Avery? Do you think I should? Uh, she's very attractive. I should. I'll report any development to you, Markham. Do that, Vance, do that. I'll be here somewhere trying to find some records of contributions. They must be around unless the murderer took them with him. Which is not at all unlikely. See you in a little while, Vance. Right, I'll go in and talk to Miss Avery now. Why, um, hello. Hello. Miss Avery, I'm Philo Vance. Really? You're not at all the way I pictured you, Vance. No. Mm -mm. Should I be flattered or ashamed? Oh, well, I didn't know you were so uh, distinguished looking. I'm ashamed of those newspaper pictures. <laughs> oh, I like that. You're either very easily pleased, Miss Avery, or very anxious to cater to my vanity. In either case, there are several questions I want to ask you. Oh, I'll uh, save you the trouble of asking, then. I've got the answers already. Oh, yes? Yes. My name is Elise Avery. I worked for Consolidated Charities soliciting contributions. I got a salary. I had no idea this was a racket, and I don't know who killed Mr. Miller. Very interesting, very informative, and very pet. Miss Avery, you know that Mr. Miller was killed by a bullet in the heart? Yes, I do. Mr. Markham told me that. He also told me about a bullet in the calf of his leg. Oh, I don't see the connection, if any. I believe there is one, Miss Avery. Vance. May I confess something? Not the murder. No, of course not. Then go right ahead. I've uh, wanted to meet you for a long time, Vance. Ever since I first saw your picture in the papers and began reading about you. We went through this flattery routine a while ago, didn't we? Oh, I don't want anything from you, Vance. I'm not looking for any favors for what I'm saying. That uh, just happens to be the way I feel. And so, I'm saying it. Well, I find this most enjoyable. Please continue. All right. I've often wondered what kind of a man you were, uh, uh, where a woman was concerned. Oh? Mm -hmm. Most of the men I've known were dull. You look different. You uh, sounded different in the stories I read about you, and yet in person, you're still different. Attractively different. If you believe that I'm not merely trying to return a compliment, I might say that you're different too, Miss Avery, and very attractive. Then what's keeping the two of us so much apart? Come uh, closer, Vance. Hmm? Courage is one of my strong points, Miss Avery. I'm here. How much uh, courage do you have, then? Adequate amount, I'd say. Enough to come still a little closer? Hmm? This is what I like about a murder case. You never know what's going to turn up next. <laughs> right now, it should be my toes. Oh, no, I never felt quite like this before. Then, let's not talk about a murder case. That suits me. Concentration is one of my weak points. Then? <clears throat> I was just thinking of that myself. And what are we waiting for? Nothing that I know of. <clears throat> Vance. Vance, darling. Vance, I just... Oh, oh. oh, I, oh. <laughs> I beg your pardon, both of you. Oh, Markham, well, come in, please, come in. I guess I'm supposed to say I hope I'm not intruding, but I guarantee all three of us know I am. <laughs> <laughs> you're not kidding. Oh, but you're not really intruding, Markham, honestly. Although it's true that you did interrupt me while I was embracing Miss Avery. Oh, after the way you've kissed me, my name is Elise. Very well. well. Markham, it's true that you did interrupt me while I was embracing Elise. 
But that embrace was in the nature of an experiment. Uh, an experiment? Really? Yes, Elise, an experiment. An experiment that tells me whether or not you killed Michael Miller. <laughs> This is District Attorney Markham. The listless murder case began with the finding of the body of Michael Miller, who headed a racket organization he called Consolidated Charities. The firm was reported to me by prominent Morton Gary, who was being used as a dupe by Miller, and subsequent investigation disclosed Miller was shot with bullets in his heart and in the calf of the leg. Milo Vance is under the impression that the murderer has a bruise on his face or a blackened eye, but has refused to indicate why he believes this. Vance has already questioned Elise Avery, who worked with Miller, and has told me he had an appointment with Morton Gary the following day. He should be with him about now. Nice day for walking, isn't it, Mr. Gary? Yes, very, Mr. Vance. Only I wish there weren't so much on my mind. That's the reason I decided to take this walk rather than discuss our mutual problem in your office. Uh, it's very mild out, this is a very secluded street, and we're quite alone. I can't quite get over my being used as a cover-up for that Miller and his gang. So many of my friends donated money to his mythical charities. Mr. I Vance. can understand that. Perhaps something you might tell us will give us a lead to his killer, though. Well, I told you all I could. But apparently I haven't been much help, though. I wouldn't worry about that. You may think of something which seems unimportant, but which might solve this entire case for us. I believe... Drop to the ground! What? Oh, Vance. Vance, what is this? Who is that in the car? I don't know. I didn't see the license. It was covered with some sort of rag. Oh. The car's gone. I think it's safe to get up now. All right. Oh. Get very dirty, Mr. Gary? No, no, I don't think so. You pulled me down on top of you. But how can you be so calm, man? Don't you realize somebody just tried to kill you? Somebody did shoot, but after all, he missed. So what's there to be excited about? Oh, I've, I've heard things like that about you, Vance, but I didn't believe them until this very minute. Oh, you're quite a man, sir. Thank you. Only I suggest that we go somewhere else to finish our talk. I don't believe we ought to give our assailant another chance. That's very sensible, Mr. Gary. I wish there was some way of chasing after him or of identifying that car. Well, apparently, you've made more progress on this case than you think, Vance. There's no question but that the killer feels you're getting close to his trail and tried to prevent that by killing you. Really? Well, Mr. Gary, if I were you, I'd appeal to Mr. Markham for police protection. You would, Vance, but why? Why? Because I believe those bullets were meant for you. All right, Vance, you came down here to tell me you believe someone tried to kill Morton Gary. Why would anyone want to do that? And what's more important, who was it? Sorry, Markham, I can't tell you. Well, suppose you clear up that first mystery, then. No sense in having two unexplainable remarks by you go unanswered? You mean, why do I think the killer would have a mark on his face? Yes. Suppose you take your top coat off, sit down, and let me have the details on that one. Hmm? I'm not staying long enough to sit, Markham. But I will tell you why I think as I do. All right. You mentioned to me over the telephone that Michael Miller had a bullet wound in his heart and one in the calf of his leg. That's right. It's the bullet in his leg that leads to my line of reasoning. I think that the killer fired from the floor and his first shot struck Miller in the leg. In other words, he was lying on the floor, Miller was standing over him, probably about to kick him, and the killer shot. Yes. His first bullet struck Miller in the leg. Miller staggered back. The killer got up off the floor and shot him in the heart. Hmm. Well, that still doesn't explain the bruised face. Doesn't it? Well, isn't it logical, if the killer were on the floor, that Miller had knocked him down first? And if he knocked him down, wouldn't it seem as if there should be a bruise? Yes, yes, it would. Uh, Vance, while you're in a true confession mood, why not explain why you were embracing Miss Avery yesterday? Certainly. There was no bruise on her face, Markham, but her makeup might have been used to cover it, if she did have one. What? While I was ostensibly kissing her, I was actually trying to rub off as much of her makeup as I could. Oh, I see. And as there was no bruise, that relieves her of suspicion then, I suppose. I wouldn't go that far, my friend. I could be completely wrong about this. Personally, I don't believe you are. But as long as you've been so cooperative, Vance, here's a piece of news for you. There were three people in Miller's charity racket. Miller, Elise Avery, and a secretary, a young fellow named Donald Stone. Uh, we've overlooked him, haven't we, Markham? Well, I think we can do something about that. Miss Avery knew him, of course. Yes, she did. Well, perhaps I'll call her on the telephone and ask her something about him I want to know. Come to think of it, there was a memorandum at my office saying that 
She had phoned earlier today. Oh? I wonder what she wanted. From the tone of the message she left, apparently she didn't believe what I said in her office, that the embrace between us was merely an experiment. She seemed to regard it more as a sample. <laughs> You know, I'm beginning to get an idea about you, Elise. An idea I don't like. Now I know why you called and wanted to come up here. Anytime you get an idea, Donald, that's news. Now shut up and let me think. I'll let you think, all right. I'll let you think about me. Vance called me. You know that he suspects I killed Miller? Does he? I've got news for you, kid. Vance never suspects anybody. He knows who killed Miller. And what makes you so calm? Now, wait a minute, you punk. Don't you even think I had anything to do with killing the boss? No, why not? He was holding out your cut on you. You had all the reason in the world to kill him. Look, lad, just don't let me lose my temper. And talking about people who had reason for knocking off Miller, what about you? You knew he was going to get rid of you when this campaign was over, didn't you? He was going to kill me? Sure. He didn't trust you. He was afraid you'd talk if anybody put the heat on. You were new with Miller. Remember that. Oh, so he was going to kill me. He didn't, did he? That's all you have to worry about. Now, um, what did you do with the money in the sucker list that was in the office? I want my share of the money. I don't know what you're talking about. No? Well, suit yourself. Maybe Vance will know. You've got one more chance, chum. I want half of the dough you must have taken from Miller. Well? Okay, if that's the way you want it, it's okay with me. I'll be seeing you. So long. Wait a minute. Now you're getting smart, Donald. Where's the money? Here in my desk drawer. There wasn't too much cash, just $20,000. Well, hand over ten. And, uh... By the way, how'd you get that nine, cut on your six, chin, hmm? Seven, eight, nine, ten thousand. Here's your half, and I got the cut on my chin from shaving. Oh, thanks for the money, Donald. You're being smart. The less Philo Vance knows about you, the better you should like it. You said he knew who killed Miller. Knowing and proving are two different things, friend. And since you've seen the light, we'll just keep Vance in the dark. <laughs> Vance speaking. Hello, Vance. Yes? This is Elise Avery. I had tried to reach you earlier today. I know. I got your message. I'd like to see you, Vance. So your message said. It isn't what you think, Vance. I'm trying to help you. I can tell you about Donald Stone, who was Miller's assistant in that charity racket. He has a prison record, and I happen to know he stole at least $20,000 from the office after the murder. That's so? Mm Mm-hmm. What happened? Did he refuse to give you a cut of it? What do you mean? I mean, you must have had some reason for waiting this long to tell me that, Miss Avery. The chances are you were waiting for a chance to blackmail him. No, that's not true, Vance. I just want to help you. That's the only reason I've told you about Stone. In that case, Miss Avery, thank you. But believe me, I don't believe you. Hello, Mr. Vance? Hi, Miss Williams. Mr. Markham in? Uh, No, he's not. Why don't you take your hat and coat off, Mr. Vance? uh, He won't be long. Thank you. I'll do that. All right to lay them on this chair? Certainly. Thank you. Why, Mr. Vance, what on earth is that on your shoulder? Paint? No, Miss Williams. Looks like paint, doesn't it? Actually, it's something I'm preserving rather carefully. It's the clue to the murderer of Michael Miller. That spot? That's right, Miss Williams. And I think that perhaps I'd better not wait for Markham. I have some things to do, but would you ask Mr. Markham to have Miss Avery, Mr. Donald Stone, and Mr. Morton Gary in my office in an hour? Well, yes, of course. Tell him that I'll be ready to name Mr. Miller's murderer then. All three of our suspects are in my outer office, Markham? Yes. Good. Would you ask them to come in, please? Of course, Vance. Miss Avery, Miss Gary, yes. Donald, yes, Mr. Vance would like you all to come in now. Oh, very well. Thank you all for being here. I thought you'd all like to know who killed Michael Miller. You, Donald Stone. No, Vance, it wasn't me. I swear it wasn't. I didn't say it was. I think, though, that it was you who fired those shots at Mr. Gary here and myself this morning before you realized that I knew you were Miller's secretary. You think I shot at you? I know you did, and I know why. 
You wanted to kill Mr. Gary because he could identify you as working for Mr. Miller. According to Miss Avery, you have a prison record. Why, you didn't want to be linked with this case. So she told you, did she, about me? Yes. Well, I'll tell you a couple of things about her. Nothing I don't know already, believe me, Mr. Stone. Mr. Gary. Yes? This is the young man who shot at you. What do you think we ought to do with him? Lock him up. He's dangerous, Vance. By all means, lock him up. He's dangerous because he shot at you and me and missed. What would you do with someone who didn't miss, Mr. Gary? I'd see that he went to the chair. That's what I'd do. Well, in that case, I hope you are reconciled to it. Mr. You killed Michael Miller, Mr. Gary. What? I? Why should I kill him? When you found out he was running a racket using your name, you were so blinded by rage that you attacked him. He knocked you down. But... While you were on the floor, you shot. Oh, I, I did. But he was going to hit me with a chair while I was lying on the floor. He would have killed me. Perhaps. That, of course, we'll never know. Uh, Vance, there's something I'd like to know. Yes, Markham? How did you know it was Gary here who killed Miller? I'll tell you, Markham, later. I'm listening, Vance. You knew Miller was killed by Gary. How? Remember, Markham, my theory about the killer having a bruise on his cheek? Yes, but Gary had no bruise. Oh, yes, he did. It was covered with makeup, so we couldn't see it, but it was there. But if makeup covered it, how did you know? Your secretary noticed a spot on my shoulder today. I'd wondered earlier how it had gotten there. But then I realized that there was only one way. And that was? That was when Gary fell against me on the street when we were both walking and the shots were fired. It was mild, and I wasn't wearing a topcoat. Oh, I get it now. When you realized how you got the makeup on your shoulder, you realized Gary would have only one reason for wearing makeup, to hide a bruise. That's right. Vance, you're wonderful. Come now, you're beginning to sound like Elise Avery. You better stop. I will, I will, if you'll tell me what happened to the list of people that contributed to Consolidated Charities and gave this case its name. That list? Donald Stone probably destroyed it. He found Miller dead, stole whatever money was around, and tried to hide the fact that the Consolidated Charities was a racket. Yeah, pretty low racket, Vance. I'm glad we ended it. And I'm glad we ended the listless murder case. Welcome back. The title of this episode is a really silly pun. And I also have to say that the scene between Vance and the suspect was one of the most uncomfortable and odd uh, radio love scenes. I was like, oh, what is going to happen here? Not really what I expect with Philo Vance. And one thing I have noticed about this particular series is that so many clues uh, and the, the setup rely on the idea of the audience having a set expectation for uh, a particular gender that's not actually absolute. You know, we had the whole thing with the herringbone suit that I went over last week, and uh, 
But, but there are other episodes like the midget murder case where the solution came down to one of the murders being a strangler that required with some, someone with strong hands. And you would have thought that it was the strong man, but it was actually the acrobat who had uh, developed her hands uh, through her uh, performing. And in this episode, we don't typically associate wearing makeup with men and associate it with women. So we would think that if anyone were covering up a sign of attack, it would have been our female suspect. Particularly since none of the male suspects had something like a theatrical background where you would expect that. But a wealthy man could get himself a concealer stick or something like that pretty easily. It doesn't happen every week, but if you're trying to solve these at home in advance, you might want to be aware that this is definitely in the bag of tricks for the writer. Well, now I do want to go ahead and thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to Margie, Patreon supporter since... Uh, September of 2016, currently supporting the program at the detective sergeant level, uh, $7.14 or more per month. Again, thanks so much for your support, Margie. And that will do it for today. If you enjoy this podcast, please leave a review wherever you download your podcast from. We'll be back next week with another episode of Philo Vance, but coming up tomorrow, it's another adventure with yours truly, Johnny Dollar, where... Expense account item one, $19.85, train fare and incidentals between Hartford and New York City. Item two, 75 cents, cab fare to a hotel, where I registered and called the offices of the Maury Production Company. I made an appointment to see Mr. Milton Gradke, the producer. Expense account item three, 55 cents for another cab to Gradke's well-appointed office on 45th Street. Really, Mr. Dollar, I'm just as concerned about this situation as the insurance company is. In fact, I'm probably a whole lot more concerned. A whole lot. Well, we've got a schedule to meet. We've got a sponsor and a network to account to. And if our star is sick, I... I just came down to see if I could help. It's a breakdown, Mr. Dollar. Who can help with a breakdown? Are you a doctor? You're a close friend, huh? Yes, yes, very close. I can't do anything. How could you? What caused the breakdown? (laughs) Such a question. What causes the breakdown? What causes breakdowns? Again, it's for a doctor to say, I'm only a producer. Well, the company doctor felt it was something of a personal nature. Something more than just overwork. Well, I I know Phil is sick. He's really in a bad shape. And I know if he doesn't snap out of it, this show is going on the rocks. It may be personal, but that's not for me to say. Phil's had enough trouble in the past. Well, this time he could be ruined. Who is his personal physician? Ewing, Charles Ewing, the best man for this sort of thing. I got the best. I'd like to talk to him. He's probably over with Phil now. Oh, fine. I'll stop by. Oh, he, uh, he won't allow you to see Phil. You can't see him, Mr. Dollar. Okay, then I'll just talk to the doctor. Maybe Ewing's back at his office now. Why don't you, uh, go over to his office instead, huh? It'll be a whole lot easier if you go over to Mr. his... Mr. Gradke. Yes? What's the matter? Don't you want me to talk with Philip Morey? He's sick, very sick. You sure that's all? Of course that's all. You got the doctor's report? Yeah, but if you don't mind, I'll check it myself. Your company may be in trouble, Mr. Gradke, but my company is paying for it. I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. And become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.